Hi everyone, it's John here. And I'm Lou, and welcome to our latest video. Today we're going to take you to the beautiful city of Dreaming Spires, Oxford, located on the edge of the Cotswolds, one of England's areas of outstanding natural beauty. Now, Oxford is of course famous as a centre of academic excellence through its world-renowned university. It has a reputation for lovely architecture, great shopping, pretty open spaces and fascinating museums. But what does all that promise translate to in reality? Well, we've carried out loads of research so that we can make this video unbiased, interesting and factual. So over the next few minutes, we'll tell you all you need to know to make the most of a day trip or longer in one of England's most appealing cities. We'll offer you an overview of the key sites and attractions here in Oxford. And towards the end of our video, we're also going to offer advice on getting here, including day trips from London by public transport, bringing a car, accommodation, and what weather to expect areas to eat and some ideas of how you can use Oxford as a stepping stone to other stunning Cotswold towns. Oxford is about 60 miles or 100 kilometres northwest of London and lies on the eastern edge of a region known as the Cotswold area of outstanding natural beauty. It was once described as a city of dreaming spires due to the architecture of the colleges which make up its world famous ancient university. Now many people will only have a day to explore the city, so the first part of our video focuses on some recommendations to help you make the most of that day. But we'll also mention some additional things to do within the city if you're lucky enough to have longer. Oxford attracts nearly half a million visitors a year for good reason. And whilst the city itself is compact, there's plenty of space and options to minimise exposure to the crowds. So let's get started now with the first place in our tour, the Ashmolean Museum. This was Britain's first public museum and dates back to 1683. It is the University of Oxford's Museum for Art and Archaeology. The world famous collections range from Egyptian mummies to contemporary art, telling human stories across cultures and across time. Now entry is free, although they will ask you for donations. Now you could spend literally a day here, but in reality you need to allow at least an hour. We'd suggest loosely following one of the audio tours which are available on the museum's website. The highlights tour, for, for example, only costs around $5, or you can also follow it by looking for the blue plaques on the museum floor. If you do want the flexibility of this option, then don't forget to bring some headphones with you. At the top of the museum is a lovely cafe restaurant which offers a good opportunity to rehydrate at a reasonable cost in lovely surroundings with good service. There is an outdoor terrace if the weather's good and they also offer things like an afternoon tea overlooking some of the city's famous rooftops. Now next up we're going to offer you one of the three pubs included in our tour. Now many of Oxford's pubs lay claim to various records including the oldest, places where famous people got drunk, or worse, and where renowned novels or documents were written or debated. Our favourite is a place called the Lamb and Flag, which is owned by St John's College. It's relatively non-touristy and serves good beer, but limited food options. It say. dates back to at least 1566 and the back room here is possibly an original room. C.S. Lewis, Graham Greene and Thomas Hardy are alleged to have been regulars at various points in their careers. Next stop, and about a five minute walk away, is the Church of St Michael at Northgate. It's a nice little church just off busy Corn Market Street. It's free to get into the church and it has a Saxon tower which you can climb for £3.50 or about $5. If you're in Oxford on a Monday then there is a free musical recital held at the church starting at 1pm on some Mondays which makes a lovely interlude to a busy day sightseeing but remember the spa is closed during the recital. <laughs> Now we're going to visit the Oxford Covered Market now for a spot of shopping and lunch. The market includes numerous individual eateries serving everything from sushi to coffee, cakes to noodles. 
There are some also some lovely stalls selling quirky and unique gifts and crafts as well as the renowned Ben's Cookies. So great excitement, we found Ben's Cookies in the covered market. Um, the selection was amazing. I've only chosen one, I might have to go back for more, but I chose the orange and chocolate cookie. Uh, they are quite expensive at £2.30, but anyway, here we go. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Brilliant, worth every penny. Whether you visit the market before or after the church, it's a great place for a bite to eat at a reasonable price. Next, it's time for a bit of exercise and we're gonna climb the St. Martin's Tower, more popular and known as the Carfax Tower. Now, this is a 23 meter high bell tower, which offers great views over the city for four pounds, just over $5. It's well worth the trip on a nice day and the photo opportunities are excellent. The tower was built in the 12th century as the bell tower for St. Martin's Church, but it is all that is now left. We're going to cover a visit to the colleges shortly, but during our research we had read that Lincoln College was one of the remaining colleges which permits free entry. The staff there confirmed that they do not offer entry, paid or otherwise, but Turl Street where the college is located is pretty and you can view the college quadrangle from outside. Our next stop is pub number two. The Bear claims to be Oxford's oldest pub, dating back allegedly to 1242. Its pleasant traditional interior is decorated with a collection of 4,500 ties started in the 1950s, but the reputation for being the oldest pub in Oxford does make it a bit of a tourist trap. Ice cream? Ice cream. <laughs> Oxford's own chain of George and something ice cream cafes rival many of the better known international chains and offers a great selection of homemade ice creams and savoury snacks. Now there are three branches within, within the city, the most central one being the George and Danver on Old Gates, close to Christchurch College and the Carfax Tower, well worth the trip. If you're here for just one day, then it's wise to make a choice at this stage. In reality, you probably have time to visit either Christchurch College or Magdalen College but squeezing both in might be a bit of a challenge. Now we elected to visit Magdalen College mostly because the weather was particularly nice and we were keen to take advantage of a ticket which bundles a visit to the college with entry to the Botanical Gardens just over the road. This was £15 for both or about $20. Now, if you do want to go into Christchurch College, then we will cover that towards the end of our video. But if not, don't worry, because en route from the Carfax Tower and ice cream shop, you can walk past the Christchurch College through the beautiful Christchurch Meadows, and you can see punting on the River Cherwell, and also take in the Watcher Tree at the junction between Christchurch Meadow Walk and Broad Walk, if you can spot that tree. So we'll take you to Oxford Botanic Gardens next, followed by Magdalen College. You can buy the joint ticket at either venue. Allow about an hour to visit the gardens in nice weather. There are glass houses as well as acres of open gardens and a coffee shop if you're thirsty. Now just over the road is Magdalen College. The college was founded in 1458. It's one of the richest of Oxford's colleges and strongest academically. It accepts just under 300 undergraduate students every year from nearly 2,000 applicants. Your ticket allows you to self-guide around some of the college, including the chapel, dining hall and the gorgeous quadrangles. 
Now allow an hour or so for your time here. It's then about a 10 minute walk to our third pub. Founded in 1381 and subsequently renamed the Turf Tavern, it's famous as a student pub which became popular because it sat just outside the original city walls and allows students to carry out illegal gambling activities away from the jurisdiction of the college's governing bodies. Visitors from the United States are keen to visit to witness the place where Bill Clinton is claimed to have smoked but not inhaled weed. <laughs> Just along St Helens Passage from the Turf Tavern is the Hartford Bridge, better known as the Bridge of Sighs because of its similarity to the similar bridge in Venice. This photo opportunity is opposite our next landmark, the Bodleian Library. This is Oxford University's main research library and contains over 13 million printed items which makes it the second largest library in Britain after the British Library, which is the largest Brit library in the world. Now for a fee you can visit the library in the evening on a guided tour. We chose not to do this but if it does interest you then we link the appropriate website in the video description. Next to the Bodleian Library is Radcliffe Camera, an iconic round building that is often pictured as representing Oxford University. It is home to the History Faculty Library and linked to the Bodleian, Bodleian Library by an underground link. Another well-known building in this area is the Sheldonian Theatre. It was completed in 1669 and was designed by Christopher Wren. It's used for university ceremonies as well as musical productions, lectures and more recently dramatical productions. You can visit on certain days as listed on their website and the cupola at the top offers lovely views over the nearby college spires. Now in reality, by the time you get here on a day tour, it's likely that the theatre will be closed to visitors. The views from the cupola are lovely and if you have time, worth the effort of the climb to the top and the £4.50 entrance fee but Carfax Tower should probably be your number one choice as a vantage point over the city. The penultimate stop on our tour are the Oxford Museum of Natural History and the equally renowned Pitt Rivers Museum right next door. These are about a 10 minute walk from the Sheldonian Theatre. They're built in the mid to late 1800s and both are free to enter, although as with the Ashmolean Museum, you are asked to give a donation. These are also places where you could lose yourself for a whole day but they close at 5pm, so you might well find that they close long before you've seen all you wanted to see. The final stop on our tour takes us 10 minutes back to opposite the Sheldonian Theatre. Blackwell's Bookstore was founded in 1879 and is now a major supplier of academic and other books. The store in Broad Street, Oxford should be on your tour, if only to marvel at the Norrington Room in the basement, where there are five kilometres of shelves housing 160,000 or more of new books on all subjects. Be warned that you could easily get lost in thought here, so can you keep an eye on the time. It might feel like we've gone back on ourselves, but we've done it this way because the museum closes at five, whereas Blackwell's is open till seven, except on a Sunday. Now that probably will take you to the end of your day if you are just here for a day trip. We realise we have crammed an awful lot in there, but believe us, you can do what we've just mentioned in a day because we did it ourselves. It will probably take you till around about seven o'clock in the evening, assuming that you manage to start somewhere between 10 and 11 o'clock. But if you do have longer, what else is there to see? Well, a visit to Christchurch College is well worth it as an alternative or even as an extra to Magdalen College, if you have time. You can either opt for a guided tour or a multimedia tour and prices start at £16 or $20, depending on the type of tour that you select. Slots can be booked online and are released on a Friday for tours during the following week. During peak times, the tours do sell out, so if this is one of your must-do items in Oxford, then it's probably worth building your itinerary round this tour. The college, hall and cathedral are beautiful, and the Great Quadrangle is the largest of any Oxford college. 
It was founded in 1546 by King Henry VIII and as well as being the wealthiest of the Oxford colleges, it also stands alone as containing the Cathedral of the Diocese of Oxford. It is sister to Trinity College Cambridge, which was also founded by King Henry VIII and boasts to have educated more British Prime Ministers than any other Oxford or Cambridge College. There are about 700 students here. The other popular tourist pastime in Oxford is punting. You can either do this by punting your own boat or hiring one with a driver. Expect to pay around £30 or $40 for an hour if you punt yourself and up to four people or £45 or about $60 for half an hour with a chauffeur. There are a couple of spots where you can hire them but Magdalen Bridge right by the Botanical Garden is a convenient location. If you have the time, then the area to the west of Oxford, known as the Cotswolds, contains some truly beautiful towns and villages. Our favourite is Burford, about 30 kilometres away. We'll talk about getting there in a moment, but if you want to experience a traditional market town with lovely buildings, quaint pubs and restaurants, then Burford makes a great choice. You probably could do it justice in a couple of hours, but allow longer if the plan is to enjoy one of the many cafes, restaurants or pubs like we did. Another good choice, although a further 10 kilometres to the west, is the smaller village of Lechlade. It is renowned for its lovely buildings and walks along the River Thames. Finally, we love Borton on the Water. It's another classic English Cotswold village, dissected by a lovely river. It's further again from Oxford, but if you have the means to get there, it makes a great place to sample British country life. Now just be aware that it does get quite busy with tourists in the summer, especially in the mornings. Before we move on to more practical things, we'd just like to make a quick request. If you like this video, then it makes a big difference to us and our channel. If you would like the video, like it, and of course, subscribe. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to more practical issues now, and we'll start with how to get to Oxford. If you're arriving by public transport, then you're likely to be using either coach or train. Most coaches arrive into Gloucester Green Coach Station, and London departures leave from Victoria Coach Station. A company called Air, the airline, also operates services to and from Oxford, but these go to and from Heathrow and Gatwick airports. Now, journeys by train are typically faster and, of course, less impacted by traffic, but pricing is more complex. You have two options getting from London to Oxford by train. You can depart from either London Paddington or smaller London Marylebone Station, but the two stations are less than a mile apart. There are two services an hour from Marylebone operated by Chiltern Railways, which take around an hour and 20 minutes, and typically three an hour from Paddington operated by Great Western, with the fastest taking just 50 minutes. Now UK rail fares are as complex and confusing as air fares. Sometimes booking at least a day in advance will offer cheaper fares, the what are known as walk-up fares. Now these are weekday prices to go there and back on the same day. Weekends are typically cheaper, especially at peak times, and travelling there one day and back on another can also make it more expensive. If you are travelling in a group of three or more, then there is a discounted ticket called a group save ticket which will save you money provided that you all travel together in both directions. We told you it was complex, didn't we? If you're arriving by car, then we'd strongly advise you to use the park and ride facilities which are dotted around the city outskirts. You park your car and then catch one of the regular buses into the city centre. Typically, this costs around £5 or $7 for car parking for one day, plus two adults return on the bus. The bus will drop you at a number of stops in the city. 
The system works really well and saves the expense, hassle and delays of taking your car and finding parking in the city itself. Now, if you're planning to visit some of the Cotswolds, then life is a great deal more simple if you have a car, as public transport west of Oxford does exist, but it's less frequent. Burford is accessible by public transport, and it's about an hour by direct bus from Oxford. It costs two pounds each way. In theory, Lechlade and Borton can be reached by public transport, but you'll need to plan really carefully. If you do have a car, then you can easily take in Burford, Lechlade and Borton in one day. Now let's move on to accommodation. Accommodation in Oxford city centre can be expensive. When students are not in residence, however, some colleges do rent out student, student accommodation to tourists. As most of the rooms are single rooms, you might find that you need more than one room for your group. But we'd recommend considering this as an option, especially in summer when hotel prices are high. There are also some budget hotels such as Premier Inn and Travel Lodge close to the park and ride facilities, and they will therefore have good bus connections back into the city. There are also nice hotels in Burford, so it might be worth considering spending a night there if you have the time. Now, inconsistent is probably the best way to describe the climate in Oxfordshire. During the peak summer months of June to August, temperatures during the day can vary between 15 degrees Celsius, that's 59 degrees Fahrenheit, to well over 25 degrees Celsius, which is 77 Fahrenheit. Heavy summer rains are not unusual. January is the coldest and wettest month, with temperatures ranging from below freezing to around 10 degrees Celsius. Snow is rare, but not unheard of. May, June and September can offer the best compromise between the chance of good weather and lower than average tourist numbers. The summer university term typically ends around the 20th of June. Okay, so where to eat in Oxford? The city centre offers a large choice of restaurants and pubs, ranging from chains to independent establishments. We really liked the covered market, but it closes by 5.30pm Sundays to Wednesdays. It is, however, open until 10pm Thursdays to Saturdays. Now, if you're looking for independent, quirky places to eat, then we'd recommend Cowley Road, which is about a 30 minute walk from the city centre. There's a good bus service if you don't want to walk and Cowley Road features a wide range of pubs, cafes and restaurants serving many different types and price ranges of cuisine. Well, that is the end of our video. We really hope you've enjoyed it and found it useful. Oxford really is a fantastic place to visit, especially if you're lucky enough to have a dry, clear day. It offers a different experience to London and a chance to see another aspect of England and its history. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to look at our other videos and guides and we hope to see you next time. Thank you.